a lifespan. I just remind you there, Kathy. <laughs> Autistic individuals are across the lifespan are much more at risk of developing an eating problem. Okay, and I've put some on the screen at the moment that are some of the common ones that we come across. They're things like avoidant and restrictive food intake disorder or ARFID, which is quite new. Things like anorexia nervosa, PICA, that's the eating of non-foods, rumination disorder. And all of those are in a diagnostic manual, um, which we call DSM-5. Hang on a sec. That's it. Screen frozen as it does. Um, DSM-5. And we've got a couple of other ones, controlled eating, orthorexia nervosa. I'll explain a bit about those later. Um, they're not in diagnostic manuals at the moment, but they're common sort of disordered patterns of eating that we sometimes see autistic people uh, presenting with. And, and the kind of how it gets complicated is it may be possible for people to have features of one of these or perhaps features of all of them in combination. And that's one of the reasons why I think services find it incredibly difficult to provide the right interventions and so on for people because it can have, have these very um, complex consequences. So what we're gonna really cover today is the relationship between eating disorders and autism. So how do those two things interact? And why is it that autistic people are more at risk? And the kinds of things we'll be covering are sensory processing, the impact of anxiety and mental health, and some of the cognitive or sort of thinking factors, if you like, around how autistic people process information and respond to that. And as we're doing that, we'll be talking a lot about the impact that has on individuals, on families, um, and also what we can do about it. Okay, so, you know, there are interventions that are starting to emerge or interventions that certainly have a, a good practice based evidence to them um, and I hope some of those will be useful to you and we'll cover issues around like I said complexity around what the risks might be how we can better recognize and understand these issues and also sort of how common they are and just a, a little caveat really everything I'm going to talk about today is based on research evidence or clinical practice practice of myself and other colleagues and and so on, but also hugely um, dependent, I would say, on groups like yourselves. So I, I meet families all the time and do a lot of talking to groups. And I've learned a huge amount from doing that in terms of the sorts of strategies that work or don't work or the kinds of things that families have told me, which has built up my um, knowledge uh, in this area. So thank you to for all the people who have contributed to that. And I'm sure you'll be one of those groups too. Okay, so another, another quote for you. This is Kenneth Hall. He was 11 when he wrote his book about having Asperger's. And he's telling us about what he doesn't like about foods, trying new things. He's got a, a very limited range, uh, particularly hates foods with bits in, things mixed together, anything that's the wrong texture for him. And then he tells us all about his favorite food, which is Pringles, the way they look, the taste, color, smell, and texture of them. And you can see a picture of Pringles on the screen quite uniform, although not completely uniform, as young people have told me, but, but it's easy to see they're just looking at those white is that kind of saying those things are just right for him. And another quote for you, this is, this time this is a fictional character, although if you know this book, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, it's, it's actually a very good representation of a, an autistic young man. And uh, in the book, he talks quite a lot about some of his eating and drinking difficulties. And again, he's listed them here. So not eating or drinking anything for a long time. Doesn't like to touch particular things of a particular color. Um, won't eat foods if different sorts of foods touching each other. We, we call that contamination. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about that later. And then there's a little bit there about what him and his mum used to do in order to try and get him to have a bit more. So I, again, I think that quote's quite good because it highlights again, some of those other things that we are interested in. Okay, so when I used to work independently, which I used to do, I used to have a, a clinic uh, based in Birmingham for this type of eating problem, this very sort of restricted eating problem, mostly with autistic people. Um, I would ask families to bring a food diary with them, of, of a typical day or a typical three day snapshot, of what, what their child, young person, or uh, if it was an adult, what they would eat. And over time, I would collate the foods and just have a look to see what were the common things coming through. So I'm gonna show you some now. 
And I've kind of grouped them together because that's how it kind of worked. So our first group is, uh, are these foods. And these are, these are just examples, folks, okay? You might see slightly different foods in, in um, the individual that you're thinking about today. But if we look across these foods, we've got things like breadsticks, bread, toast, some form of pasta, perhaps plain pasta, usually a soft dish biscuit, something like a cracker, maybe a breakfast cereal. You'll notice that it's dry. There's no milk on that. And maybe something like a breaded nugget of some kind or those kinds of things. And, and what is it about those foods that we see coming through time and time again? Well, it's what we call our beige carbohydrates. Um, predictable, very predictable by the way they look. So they're a similar color. Um, they're made of similar uh, carbohydrate based, vegetable based uh, product, but like I said, predictable generally on site. Okay, so the toast being the right shade, uh, the biscuit not being broken, et cetera, et cetera. So very predictable by the way those foods look. And actually they often have a predictable texture as well. Okay, and texture is our next clue really. So our next group has some foods along these lines. Okay. Um, Apologies for the branding folks, I'm not here to promote particular brands, but you will see some particular things popping up in the pictures. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But here you can see some of uh, some uh, another group and I've kind of given it away already because I mentioned texture, but these are smooth single textured foods. So a smooth custard, a smooth yogurt, uh, perhaps a few puree or, or a smoothie and so on. Single textures, okay, so predictable, by their texture, no surprises, no bits, no lumps, nothing that could challenge someone who's very sensitive from a texture point of view. Okay, our next category is the chocolate category and almost universally I used to see this coming through, but not just all chocolate, a particular type of chocolate usually, milk chocolate, usually plain um, or something like the fudge topping off the top of the chocolate fudge cake. Okay, and again, why chocolate? Well, chocolate is sweet, um, the only taste preference that we are born with uh, as babies is a sweet preference, and that's because breast milk is sweet, so it directs the baby to that source of nutrition. So sweet foods are the foods that we generally find the most palatable, the most comforting, and probably the easiest to accept. Okay, and we'll talk a bit more about taste preferences a bit later on. So those... Um, Smooth chocolate, easy to accept, and again, easy texture as well. So sweet, easy texture, and um, often branded also, which brings me on to my last category, which is branded foods. So you'll see the brands popping up, like I said before, but why branded foods? Why this brand loyalty sticking to a particular brand of bread or crisp or fast food manufacturer? Well, again, it's about predictability. The brand predicts the quality, the safety of the food. Um, you know, if you go to the fast food manufacturer that's on the screen there, you could go anywhere in the world and it would be relatively uniform. OK, in fact, a, a young autistic man told me a few years ago that chicken nuggets only have six shapes from that particular manufacturer. And actually, they make you think they're random. So when you get a, a large bucket of them or a large... Uh, packet of them I think they put 20 in in those you, it's, it's meant to look like they're sort of random shapes and but actually they only have six shapes and they sort of mix them up so it looks like you've got that mix and I love that he knew that so yeah predictable by the brand by the way they look um, and the uniformity of them so when we look at this range of foods and I appreciate not all of these foods may be eaten in your homes but we tend to see these types of categories coming through these predictable by certain sensory properties so either by the way they look by the texture by the taste or by the packaging and the manufacturer who makes that okay and we'll talk about why we think that is as we go through another quote and this is from Rachel who I've known most of her life uh, she's now a young woman and she's talking about again about foods that she likes but also about how she feels sick around foods that she doesn't like okay so she's got a texture preference for crunchy things and when she was younger she would want to have a birthday cake in fact she would she'd do all the things that you're meant to do with a birthday cake light the candles sing happy birthday etc but there was no way Rachel could ever eat it because even thinking about that would make her feel sick she had an extremely 
highly set discussed response. Okay, and we'll talk a bit about disgust as we go through. And on the screen there, you can see some of the foods that she would eat. In fact, when I first met Rachel, she was really just having these chocolate crispy cakes, melted cooking chocolate and um, cheesy puff crisps. That was it really. Um, but you know, she's a good example of how as she got older, it became easier for her to try some different things. And again, we'll talk about that. Okay, I wanted to mention a little bit about how many people have eating problems. Okay, so it might surprise you to know, oh, we've got a couple of meal times there. Okay, so a lovely Edwardian looking meal time where everyone looks very happy and then perhaps another meal time where maybe that's more realistic. It certainly, certainly is in my house sometimes. Um, you know, we have expectations about meal times. That's another thing to say folks that, you know, uh, that things should be, a certain way and we should be having conversations around food and so on and I, I know that some of you may be able to manage that and some of you won't but again there's a lot of kind of pressure on meal times um, to, to be having those lovely happy times but it may surprise you to know that actually eating problems in children are extremely common okay so we know that maybe up to two-thirds of families will report that their toddler and that's just all toddlers not, not autistic toddlers particularly that their toddler will have at least one eating problem or feeding problem, okay? So it's massively common for children to have those kinds of difficulties. And most children will grow out of those. But when we start looking at children that have an additional developmental condition, okay, um, which might include autism or other kinds of issues that can happen in child's development, around 80% of those children may present with an eating and feeding problem okay so that does become much more common when we start to look at those groups and if we think about autistic children particularly maybe we're looking at almost 90 percent who are also having those difficulties with food and that, that matches for me my clinical experience I've been working for 24 years now um, in autism particularly, and um, most of that time coming across eating and feeding issues, and it does seem to be one of the most commonly reported things, or, but not one of the ones that you get the most um, support for, I tend to find, and that's why we've got quite large numbers of you here today. I think it's a very popular talk, generally, these talks that I do, um, because there isn't much out there, and I'm sure that's been your experience as well. Okay, so despite the high numbers, it's not one of the areas in autism that has had a lot of um, research done and all information provided, okay. Um, if we think about something like anorexia, that's what the AN stands for there. We know that about 20% of women with anorexia have autism, uh, and that may be diagnosed or undiagnosed, okay. So we see an awful lot of women appearing in those eating disorder services perhaps without the recognition of their autism, but maybe they go on to get that. So that's a huge number actually, if we think the prevalence of autism in the population is between one and 2%, then we're looking at um, a highly elevated prevalence there in those anorexic populations. And we'll say a bit more about that later. Okay, so if you think about our autistic children who have this limited range, and who are quite selective about their eating, they tend to be the children that have heightened sensory responses, okay? And that's what Clint went on colleagues found. So again, we, we see those children coming through, but they're the ones that definitely have those additional sensory issues or intrinsic sensory issues, but they seem to have much more of that sensitivity perhaps. And many autistic children have what's called a sensory modulation disorder. Uh, lots of words there, but really that, that means that they're struggling to maintain a stable sensory system. So that either too much information is coming in and they're getting overloaded, or perhaps not enough information is coming in and they're, they're needing more sensory stimulation. Um, the best way to show this is to show you Oliver's foods. Okay, so this is a young man I used to work with. He was around 13. Um, when I was working with him, he had autism and ADHD. And here are some of his preferred foods. And we can see that straight away, they've got that kind of beige carbohydrate thing going on. There's definitely some brand loyalty for Oliver as well. So I, that was quite a standard picture for me. But then I found out that he liked these things too. So we've got a particular type of apple, a particular type of pear and these, these fruit winder sweets, which have quite a sharp, quite a 
um, yeah, quite a sharp, almost sour taste. But he really liked these things. So he liked raspberries and then he liked these um, toxic waste and these nerd sweets, again, which have a, an extremely sour and sharp taste to them. And this puzzled me for a little while until he had a sensory assessment with a colleague of mine and turned out that he was either oversensitive or hypersensitive, meaning that he was becoming overwhelmed um, quite quickly. And when he was feeling like that, he would reach for his beige carbohydrate foods. And in some respect, they helped him kind of bring that um, feeling of being overwhelmed down. And, and when he was feeling undersensitive, because he would flip between the two, if he was feeling like he needed more stimulation, then he would reach for the raspberries, the toxic waste, the nerd sweets and so on. And that would give him that lift. So it sort of matched his pattern of eating, if that makes sense. So though we started with a pattern of eating, we actually found out a lot about his sensory processing by investigating that. So you might find that it's similar for your individual at home, that they have that pattern of um, moving between the uh, being oversensitive and undersensitive and, and trying to balance that. And I can't say enough, folks, that it's really important to get a good understanding of someone's sensory processing when it comes to food. It's so crucial to food and eating. OK, so what do we see in a core, in a, a sort of a core range of features in autism around eating? So number one, we see this sensory hypersensitivity to foods. OK, so that's the look of foods, the texture, smell and taste of foods. And I've added noise on the end there because noise, whilst it isn't something directly involved in eating, if you're in a noisy environment, then that's definitely going to contribute to any feeling of being overwhelmed. And if you're overwhelmed in one sense, then that's going to affect the others as well. OK, and the, uh, the look of the foods is very important, including the packaging and any changes to the packaging can um, trigger a rejection. I'm sure some of you have experienced that. OK, the other thing we see, and this is definitely related to the sensory hypersensitivity, is high levels of disgust and contamination. So disgust is that evolutionary based response that we have to things that we shouldn't be eating. OK, so we, we're, many people might be disgusted, for example, by feces or vomit. And obviously that, that reaction is protecting us from ingesting those things. And you'll all have foods in your own life that you find disgusting, most people do. Um, and I'll tell you about mine a bit later on. Um, so it, it, it and, and that's often to do with sensory properties again. So for example, my dad never liked mushrooms because they were slimy, okay? And people often report that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, oh, we, we have those responses, they're there for a reason, but again, they're kind of genetically set. OK, so some people are just more likely to have higher levels of disgust than others. OK, um, and with contamination. Oh, by the way, that's my slug sandwich. If you're wondering what disgust looks like, most of you will be looking at that thinking, oh, my God, that's disgusting. OK, so <laughs> that's just a reminder. Think slug sandwich. OK, um, contamination. Now, that's where a disliked food is next to or touches a like food. OK, so that's the ketchup on top of the chips, for example. Um, unfortunately, all that tends to do is, uh, like I said, contaminate that food and it can be then rejected, if that makes sense. It doesn't work the other way around. You can't make a food light by putting something um, disliked next to it. It only works in one direction. OK, um, and it's the reason why mixing foods together often doesn't work. It's the reason why hiding a food and another food doesn't work either because it just serves to contaminate. So it's a it's a reaction that we see quite commonly. And again, it's an important reaction that we actually all have. Um, you drop something on the kitchen floor. If your kitchen floor isn't very clean, you're probably going to think, OK, I won't pick that up any of that because it might get dirty and that might not be safe for me. So it's a it's a it's a good reaction. It protects the body from taking anything in that it shouldn't have. Um, but what we tend to see in autistic people is that, that it's almost like an overreaction to it. So even with things that could be safe and absolutely appropriate for most of us to eat um, can cause these really strong responses, either disgust or contamination. And of course, they are connected as well. Something else that we commonly see is something called neophobia. And some of you may have heard of that. 
it simply means fear of the new. So neo is new, phobia, fear. And it's where people will reject a food that looks different. Okay, so that's kind of what it looks like. Also a bit of the disgust there. So um, rejecting the biscuit when it's broken, for example, because it just doesn't look the same as it did before. The other thing we see is a great deal of mealtime stress and anxiety, okay, leading to kind of strong routines, rituals, a lot of rigidity around um, meal times and feeding times, okay. Um, I first met Rosie when she was about 15, and at that point she had extremely set patterns about how she would eat. She liked Coke Zero, but she could only have it in cans, and she could only have it in cans because if it was in a bottle, there was a risk that other people would touch it in the fridge and then she couldn't have it. And she would eat, drink them, sorry, at very particular times of the day and she'd have four a day. The number four was really important to raising and she had a whole set pattern about how she would do it. And the eagle eyed amongst you will see there's a couple of cans missing in that kind of setup. Mum, mum collected the cans for me over a week so, she, so I could see how many there were. And I came halfway through the last day of the week, which is why there's too missing, if that makes sense, because Rosie hadn't had them yet, but she had some extreme routines about that. Same with this lad, Jack here, who would only eat one particular type of cereal bar from a particular supermarket, and he would only eat that whilst watching a particular Bruce Springsteen video. So some of these routines and rituals can be very fixed and actually quite hard to move family life around. Other features that we see, Okay, so this is really important. So we generally see, particularly in children, but also in adults, what we call good appetite regulation. Okay, what I mean by that is that enough calories are going into the body to mean that the growth is okay and sometimes also nutritional and health issues are minimized. Okay, so children that are growing fine don't seem to be lacking anything from the diet and don't seem to be any more ill than other children. And this tends to happen if we're allowing the range of foods that we know that that person feels comfortable with, okay? So whatever those preferred foods are. So, you know, I, I'm sure that will be the case with some of you. Of course, there are exceptions and we'll talk about why that is. But what we see almost universally is this poor appetite recognition, okay? So that's not noticing hunger or being full and not responding to those things. So children that aren't saying they're hungry, they're not going to the fridge to look for food, they go a long time without eating or drinking sometimes. Or the, or the flip side of that, are young people who can't seem to stop eating and are always saying they're hungry and seem never really satisfied by food. And we think that's part of interception, okay? So that's the sense of how we feel inside our bodies. Um, and we know that Interception is a very big part of the sensory profile of many autistic people. So an, an inability to really understand what's happening in the body. So that's quite crucial. Autistic pe people with eating issues also seem to be at risk of gastrointestinal issues. Okay, so gut and bowel problems, um, such as constipation, diarrhea, persistent reflux, those sorts of things. Now we don't really know why that is. Um, there's a bit of research ongoing about that at the moment, but it, it just seems to be part of a presentation. And I always say to families that, you know, often families will come and they will say, oh, um, we've been told it's the diet that's causing the constipation or the diarrhea or whatever. Um, and, and in some cases that may well be the case. Um, but actually, and excuse the pun, we, ha we have to deal with these things from the bottom up, if that makes sense. We have to kind of, uh, manage the constipation and manage those uh, gut and bowel issues before we can really change the feeding, if that makes sense, or the eating pattern. And, and there's definitely a connection that hasn't been fully investigated yet. But if you are a family that has issues in those areas, if, you're, if your young person is struggling with those things, do try to get a referral to a specialist for that because it, it, it is really important to have that investigated. It isn't just simply a matter of, oh, it must be the diet. Um, I think quite often there are other things going on. So please take that to your GP and ask for a referral. And the other thing we see in some autistic people is PICA. So that's the eating or ingestion of, of non-nutritive or non-food substances. And there's a magpie on the screen because PICA is the Latin name for magpie, which is a bird that is known to collect objects and sometimes eat them. 
So let's just have a think about pika for a second. Okay, so like I said, the persistent eating of things that aren't food. It's been recently classified as a feeding and eating disorder. Okay, so it's, it's sort of put in with those other feeding and eating disorders, which I think is quite helpful because it, it leads us to understanding that behavior a little bit more. Interestingly, we see it across all cultures, across the lifespan, and actually there are recordings of people of people engaging in people or eating non-foods that go back to the Greek and Roman times. So it's clearly something that's been around for a very, very long time. But even though it's been around for a long time, we don't know that much about it, unfortunately. What we do know is there are certain groups of, of humans who tend to engage in this more. Um, so in some developing countries, there are traditions or cultures of earth eating which may be connected to a nutritional need or imbalance. Um, pregnant women, it's often been reported in, in, in that group as well, which again, there's been um, queries about whether it is related to nutritional deficiencies during pregnancy. And then the other group is adults with a learning disability and or autism. Now, I specifically put adults here because that's the literature. All the literature we have on PICA is with adults, okay? It's very, very little about children and PK. So it's very under-researched and very uh, poorly understood um, at the moment. But it's, it's one of those topics that I've become much more interested in as time has gone on, okay? So I'm just gonna show you some common PK items or things that, that are eaten. So we've got things like paper, string, carpet, pebbles, sand, paint, soap, feces, dirt, cloth, plastic, wood, cigarettes, chalk, and one more up there, which is hair. Okay, so these are some of the common items that you see coming through. And actually just looking at them on the screen, it's possible to kind of start to think why these items. And there's definitely something uh, from a sensory perspective that seems to be happening. So maybe it's something about texture, maybe it's something about the taste of these items how they feel when someone's eating them and so on. All right, well, come on and say a bit more about PICA a bit later on when we talk about interventions. But right now I want to talk about another eating disorder that is gaining prominence and actually I think is very applicable to autistic people, uh, avoidant and restrictive food intake disorder. Some of you may have heard of it already or ARFID for short, a lot easier to say ARFID. Okay, and like I said, we've had this diagnosis now since about 2013, and we're starting to see across the country and actually across the world, more evidence coming out about what this eating pattern relates to, uh, how we can treat it, and actually why do we see quite a lot of autistic people um, displaying this. Okay, so I'm gonna put the um, diagnostic criteria up for you. Apologies, there's lots of words on this screen folks, but I'm going to highlight the ones for you really, and we're going to talk about these in more detail going forward. So we've got this idea of apparent lack of interest in eating and food, okay, so that's not being motivated by hunger, or perhaps not recognising hunger. Avoidance based on the sensory characteristics of food, and I think we can all agree that that's definitely something that autistic people would display and concern about the aversive consequences of eating. So I've mentioned already this idea of disgust or contamination or high levels of anxiety about food and meal times and so on. So that relates to that. Now there are some other factors in ARFID that we look at when we're thinking about this pattern of eating. So for some people there is weight loss or faltering growth in children. For some people there are nutritional deficiencies. Some people will need additional feeding. So enteral feeding is like being fed through a tube or having um, high calorie supplement. And then number four there, which is marked interference with psychosocial functioning. And I think that applies to just about everybody who have, has ARFED. The idea being that having this eating pattern really interrupts your daily life. Either you as an individual, your family, what social activities you can access, how you go about getting the foods that you can have, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's really crucial. And it's, it's very good, I think, that the diagnostic criteria contains that. And then we've got some things that it isn't, okay? So it's not that there isn't enough food available for someone, uh, such as you're being neglected or they're 
in a fasting culture, perhaps. It's not the same as anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, partly because people with ARFID don't see their body shape or weight um, in, in a disturbed way. And lastly, if ARFID occurs alongside something else, such as autism, then it's possible to have both of those labels. And actually, I think that can be very helpful because it takes away the idea that somehow the eating pattern is just sort of part of autism and therefore that should just kind of stay over there. It actually highlights that it's clinically significant, perhaps, you know, quite risky for that person and, and ought to be getting some independent clinical attention, if that makes sense. So I think it's a very helpful label. And um, I think it's, it's great that we're starting to see more services coming out. So let's think about some of the things in the label and how that might apply. So we've got this idea of sensory characteristics of food. And here's another quote from Sean Barron talking about his sensitivity to texture particularly. So he had to touch things first so that he could have some idea of what they'd be like before he put, put it in the mouth. He didn't like it when textures were mixed together. So noodles with vegetables or sandwiches. And again, he's talking about his experience of that. So there was absolutely no way any of this was going into his mouth and that even the thought of it would make him feel sick. And you might find that some of the individuals that you're here to think about have those, like we said, very highly set dis discussed responses. I've certainly met a number of young people who can vomit at the sight of the food that, that they don't like uh, or someone else is eating it nearby them. So really quite extreme responses. So how does sensory sensitivity really impact on eating? Well, we've got this idea around our own neurological thresholds. So that's our own kind of set point where we're at with sensory things. OK, so, for example, I can't wear wool. It's too itchy for my skin. So that's my neurological kind of set pattern and behavior. And my behavior there is I don't buy jumpers with wool in them. OK, so I just don't wear them. And that's my way of avoiding that. So there was a, there's always an interaction factor between what we're kind of set, our set um, innate reactions and the behaviour that we have around them. And this particular model, which is the Winnie Dunn model around sensory sensitivity, divides up into kind of hypersensitive, OK, which is oversensitive. It's almost like too much information is coming in and is overwhelming a person. OK, and in terms of foods and eating, so being hypersensitive means you're more likely to refuse food, more likely to notice the appearance of food and changes to the appearance, more likely to, more likely to be really sensitive to texture, not like messy hands, lumps in food and so on, more likely to experience that sensory overload. And if one is hyposensitive, so that is kind of like there's not enough sensory information coming in, so people are under stimulated, if you like, then people might try to get that sensory stimulation by putting too much food in the mouth. Um, perhaps they've got what we call poor smell or taste discrimination. So they're not able to tell the difference between taste or smell, for example, and may display some sensory seeking behavior. So seeking out strong smells or tastes. And we wonder whether that might be a factor in PICA behavior. OK, so I find it quite helpful to split to split those responses like that and, and to think about how that impacts on food. And like I said, most people I meet are a combination of being hypersensitive or, and hyposensitive, but with the hypersensitivity often being the most obvious in their eating patterns. OK, let's think about this idea of anxiety, adversive consequences of eating and so on. Um, again, this is a, a, a quote from a parent that took part in some research I did years ago and she's really kind of talking about this as a phobia okay it's a genuine fear of food it's not a stubbornness it's not a reluctance to try something it's actually um, a really fear-based response and I think some of you hopefully can resonate with that and can know what I'm talking about so we've got this idea of neophobia. We talked about that before. So that's the rejection of foods that look different. So we've got two biscuits, one's broken, that doesn't look the same, so I'm gonna reject that. The toast is the wrong shade of brown, so I'm gonna reject that because I'm very specific about thing, how things should look. And actually we see this response in all children, 
when they're young, so around about the age of two, children start to show signs of neophobia around foods that perhaps they haven't had before or seen anyone else eat. And again, we think that's a very adaptive response. Uh, it's on, on a continuum, meaning that it's kind of related to our personalities and, and how we're born. And the adaptivity of it is that as a child is becoming mobile for the first time, they're starting to walk and toddle about. We don't want them to start eating things that they haven't seen other people eat and may not be safe. So it's a response that we think has developed a little bit like disgust or contamination. It's kind of a protective response. Um, and generally, in most children, it decreases with age. So by the age of eight, most children have gone way past that stage. But it doesn't seem to just decrease in autism. OK, and we think that's because for most children, they copy other people eating. So they, they're, they're looking around at what other people are having and they pick up those social cues. But of course, we know in autism that process doesn't necessarily happen. So that's probably what's going on there. But what we get are these very fixed neophobia responses that may go all the way through into adulthood. Generally, that means that the range of foods gets restricted to perhaps less than 20 foods. And it can be the kinds of foods that we've been looking at before, perhaps our dry beige carbohydrate or smooth textured foods, no sauces, nothing mixed together. And this, this idea of brand loyalty, so rejecting the food when the packaging changes. Okay, so the packaging predicts what's inside. If the packaging is different, then how do I know the food is okay? We also see a kind of family anxiety cycles developing, folks. And if you're stuck in one of these, my heart goes out to you. It's a really difficult issue to, to deal with some of the some of the things that we're talking about today and I'm showing you this not to say that the family is at fault it's not that at all but what we tend to what we tend to get is a cycle where we start with an eating pattern like this in a child and it has a massive impact on the rest of the family so let's have a look at that we've got a child with Arthur and we've got those things that we already know about sensory neophobia state anxiety that's anxiety in a particular situation so for this it's meal times perhaps they don't recognize their appetite got a very restricted range and maybe they're even losing weight so what does that mean for you as a family or a parent well obviously you're going to be anxious it's going to send your anxiety through the roof you're going to be worrying about the growth the health the nutritional status of your child perhaps you're worrying about where you're going to get these foods from because they're very specific Perhaps you're even locked into some mealtime battles um, and your stress levels are going through the roof. OK, and of course, that spreads out to the rest of the family. OK, now what tends to happen, unfortunately, when we become like that as parents, we end up doing what I'm going to call maladaptive strategies or processes or practices. OK, and again, not blaming anyone if you've done this, but it's just we end up somehow doing things that we kind of know aren't really going to work. But in a way, we do them anyway because we're desperate. OK, so perhaps we put more demands on the child. Please, please eat. Or you're kind of trying to push food on them, really. Um, and unfortunately, all that does is raise the anxiety levels in your child. And as anxiety goes up, so does their sensory sensitivity and their rigidity. OK, so they just kind of lock down, really, into um, a pattern of refusing more and restricting more. OK, and that can often mean more uh, weight loss, for example, and it kind of reinforces the RFID. And of course, reinforcing the RFID, all that's going to do to you as a parent is send your anxiety back through the roof. So you can see how this cycle kind of goes round, really. So again, not to blame families for this, but this is just what I've seen time and time again. And if you are stuck in that pattern, the, the best way for us to try and break it for you is to think about um, the parent care and worries really, and to find ways of reassuring families about how we deal with this issue and what it's connected to. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the second half of the talk phase. I want to say a little bit now about, um, probably go for about 10 minutes and then we'll have a break if that's okay, folks. Um, I want to say a little bit about um, People who have that kind of PDA profile or that demand avoidant profile, because I'm seeing more and more young people come through with complex eating patterns that have, have those kinds of issues. And the high levels of mental health and what that does um, in terms of eating, really. So 
Um, why do people have these demand avoidant profiles? Well, it's where high levels of anxiety and a desire to control can um, lead to these obsessive behaviours that develop and perhaps they develop around food. It's also part of what we might call an externalising or internalising um, kind of presentation. OK, so externalizing is where you see the behavior it's quite obvious what might be going on for someone but when people are internalizing and i know that we're talking today to predominantly a women and girls network a female network and we know that those internalizing profiles can be quite prevalent in that group um th these these kind of mental health and mental mental attacks on the self can be quite prominent it's almost like a form of self-harm really um and in this context so an eating disorder therefore can be a symptom of that level of stress, okay? Or it can be a coping strategy or perhaps even both. So I've certainly met um, young women and young men actually, who told me that having an eating disorder, developing these sort of restricted eating patterns was a way to self-harm or feeling in control of their body for the first time. And we know Already, the eating disorders seem to co-occur with autism. The question is, do they co-occur with demand avoidant presentations? I think they probably do, because if you look at the sorts of things that we've been talking about already, these are prevalent in PDA as well. Sensory and cognitive differences, appetite recognition, anxiety, having routines and rituals, and perhaps some of these gastroenterology issues. So you can see there's a crossover there, really. So if we think about if you have a demand avoidant individual at home who is resisting and avoiding the ordinary demands of life, how does that connect to eating? Well, eating breakfast, lunch, dinner, repeat, eating happens every day, more than once a day. In fact, you know, it's very hard to get away from. So I, I, I often think about it as being one of the greatest demands that people have to deal with. Um, we know people with PDA will use social strategies as part of their avoidance, and we, we see a lot of these in eating. So Perhaps that was Greta earlier on saying that I've had enough, I'm not hungry anymore, or perhaps like, you know, people saying I've got a stomach ache, finding other ways to avoid eating. People with demand avoidant behavior often appear quite sociable, but lack a deeper understanding. And again, for us as parents, that can lead to a great deal of stress and frustration. Okay, perhaps we're, we're not sure what's going on. They seem capable, but actually they're not managing this. And actually, without meaning to, perhaps we up the demands and then unfortunately can make things worse. Excessive mood swings are part of this profile too. And we know that any mood swing, anxiety or low mood particularly, will change someone's eating pattern. So that's another thing to lay on top of it. People with demand avoidant behavior often feel quite comfortable in their role play and are able to mask or sort of mimic or or almost pretend in that way, meaning that us as adults, we may overestimate and reinforce what's going on. And some of the obsessive behaviors in demand avoidant profiles are often focused on other people. So getting quite focused on perhaps a particular person at school or a celebrity or so on. And we see this playing out in eating where copying others such as counting calories or dieting because others are doing that or celebrities are doing it on Instagram or whatever. Then there's that kind of risk as well. So like I said, in that sense, maybe eating is one of the greatest demands. And if we think about that, from that kind of perspective, very similar to our family anxiety cycle, really, we've got this young person in a great deal of anxiety, they're restricting their foods, maybe it's the range or the amount, Perhaps they're over-exercising as well. It typically happens in adolescence and is sometimes quite hidden. Weight loss starts to appear. And of course, you as parents are going to worry about that. Your stress is going through the roof. Your demands on your young person are going to increase because you're, you really want them to eat. That's only going to cause those arguments, more anxiety, sensory issues, like we said before. Perhaps carrying on with some of those demands, which you know don't work, let's be honest, but you, you probably have got to that point yourself already, but it just leads to more restriction. And so we go round. And, and what tends to happen, I find, in, in these situations is as the young person avoids the demands being placed on them, the parent has to take control, particularly around eating, because there's such a, a stress around that. And actually, if you try to do that yourself, you know you never manage to get it just right do you cooking the toast to that absolute shade of brown is is never easy 
and uh, in the end it just leads to more battles okay and I'm going to show you some things later on about how we kind of work with that demand avoidant profile okay I think now might be a good time for a quick comfort break if that's okay with folks it's 20 past eight so if we come back would 10 minutes be okay do you think if we came back for half past Kathy I think that would be all right yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, and then we can carry on with some more PowerPoint and uh, hopefully time for questions at the end. Yeah, okay, so we'll Brilliant. see everybody at half past. Fantastic.
So welcome back everybody. Um, and I can see that Liz is there and we'll get started again. Um, we are collecting questions, so do continue to put your questions in the chat. I don't know, there are a lot of them, so I don't know how many we'll be able to get through, but we'll do our best. You're muted, Liz. That's it. Sorry, I've done it now. You know where I work, Kathy. So if we don't get through the questions, perhaps you can send them to me and uh, I could do yeah, some sure. kind of email response or something like that. Yeah, get through absolutely. Them. OK. Yeah, yeah. I just saw how many comments there were in the chat. But goodness me. Let's hope there aren't 86 questions. <laughs> All right. So I want to pick up where we were before, folks, um, with a cup of tea and, and start talking a bit about appetite and this idea of avoidant restricted eating and how it kind of fits with autism really because I've mentioned this idea of appetite um, recognition and that being one of the major issues that we deal with. Okay so what's worth knowing about how we regulate our appetite is that it's affected by all the calories that we take in all, all of the time so particularly for children and sometimes families don't know this, it's affected by milk, it's any other supplements that might be given for that child and anything that's happening throughout 24 hours really. So even if things are being given at night. So um, the brain calculates how many calories to take in based on what your child's unique growth pattern is going to be. It's quite an amazing process really. Um, but we know that appetite regulation is affected by stress. Okay, so all of us will experience perhaps overeating when we're stressed or undereating. Uh, you know, uh, people generally have one or other of those that they do. And unfortunately with children particularly, we know that stressful meal times or any kind of force feeding or forceful feeding rather is associated with, with faltering growth for children where, the, where um, there are no other kind of physical things going on. So it's definitely something that, you know, has quite a major impact. Um, for children with ARFID and, and this, uh, particularly autistic children, this restrictive pattern, they tend to regulate well, as in they take in the right number of calories, as long as they're given those foods that they can tolerate and the ones that they're showing that preference for. But like we said before, it's the recognition and response to food that is often poor. So of course, not responding to hunger and thirst cues particularly carry risks of becoming dehydrated or dangerously underweight. <coughs> And not responding to satiety or feelings of being full can have the risk of uh, obesity or weight gain, of course. Um, what, we, what we often see are children who compensate with their eating. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, this is where someone is making up for lost calories. So I first met Will when he was around 17. He was at college. Uh, autistic young man and he was going away for the weekend for the first time it was a college trip he was very excited but he was also very nervous and because he was so nervous he didn't eat anything for a week before he went or had hardly anything and then when he was away on the trip he found these frankfurter sausages that you can see on the screen they come in a tin with sort of american flag branding on them and he liked them so much he ate 300 in the weekend Okay, now that's obviously a huge amount. Um, and people will say, oh, he was binge eating, he was, you know, whatever. But actually, what, he, what Will was doing, they've got about 40 calories a, a Frankfurter. So he, he had approximately 12,000 calories over that weekend, but he was compensating for the calories he hadn't had during the week. Do you see what I mean? So it's not, it wasn't a, like binge eating, like binge eating disorder where people are doing that and there's a very strong emotional and mental health component to it. He was simply making up for the lack of calories, okay? And that's something that we do see people doing. So not eating during the school day, for example, and then coming home and eating a whole loaf of bread, that kind of thing. And, and like we said before, these appetite responses seem to be connected to interoceptive differences in autism. So how we feel in, inside our bodies and how we can recognize that. So that, that not being able to, to pick those feelings up, I think is crucial because unless you're motivated to eat and hunger is generally our motivation, then it can be very difficult to do that, particularly if there's not many foods that you want to eat anyway. 
Okay, we're going to talk now a little bit about rigidity and eating. Okay, so these are these, you know, a bit more about these routines and rituals and what's kind of affecting that really. So another quote from a parent talking about the routines that her son has to have around his Kit Kats. Uh, and interestingly, tomato sauce has to be in a bowl beside the food, not on it. So that's his contamination response there. So what do we know about cognitive differences in autism? Okay, so we know that there are some differences in the way that autistic people process information in the brain. Um, and, and some of these we think are implicated in some of these eating patterns. Okay, so we've got something called local versus global processing. That really just means you see the details rather than the whole, okay? And we think it comes from this idea of uh, central coherence, meaning that in the brain, information isn't integrated in quite the same way. How does that play out in foods? Well, it's really about attending to the details, not the whole picture. So perhaps you notice that the writing on the biscuit isn't the same as usual, or you're paying attention to the fact that the biscuit is broken rather than seeing it still and that it is digestive that you usually like, okay, and then those foods get rejected. The other thing that we think is going on, so for all children as they're growing and developing, they're learning to form categories in the brain of different objects, and usually this is about collecting sensory information and, and forming these overarching categories. So you know the dog next door, the dog next door is called Barney, it's friendly, it's got four legs and a waggy tail, and generally um, is quite, you know, is quite friendly when you see him. And then you meet other dogs and you realize that not all dogs have tails, not all dogs are friendly, and they're certainly not all called Barney, but most of us can kind of have some sense of what the category of dog contains. But we think in autism, this process is, is disruptive, or disrupted, sorry, and, and these categories don't form in quite the same way. And it, this must play into, the kind of ability to generalize information that we see as part of autism. And how that plays into food is that, that means that it's very hard for people to generalize across one food to something that's even quite similar, um, to understand that, that they have that, those similarities between them, okay? So it might be that, ooh, what's going on there? I've got some weird things happening on my screen. That's strange. Hopefully, oh, I have no, can, I hope people can, yeah, I have no idea what those lines are. They've just appeared. Okay, that's really peculiar. Maybe they'll go away. So the child finds it difficult to form these categories and then doesn't generalize. So like we said, each new food or perhaps flavor or brand will trigger that. It's different, it's new. I'm not going to have it response. Okay, I'm hoping that's not gonna stay on my slides all the way through, Kathy, but I really don't know where that is. It just popped up. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably somebody has, has managed to do it by accident, I expect. Brilliant how these things can happen. It's like magic. Well, hopefully it won't be too much in the way. Okay, so if we think about this idea of categories, and if we think about our sort of beige carbohydrate foods, it's, it's quite easy to see, isn't it, that perhaps one type of bread looks quite similar to another type of bread. So perhaps that's easier to generalise. Perhaps it's easier to generalize uh, one type of pasta to another type of pasta and so on. But if we think about something like the category of vegetables, they will look different. They've got different textures, different colors, different shapes, et cetera, et cetera. Much, much harder to generalize. So this might play into why some of those foods are chosen and other foods are not. Okay, so we know that we have other differences as well. We've got this kind of desire for sameness, which really just means that people with autism often find predicting into the future or knowing what's gonna happen next quite difficult. Um, and that might play into these ideas of having quite fixed routines and rituals around food and meal time. So that might be things about what you have to do when you're making the food and how you're putting it on the plate, how many bits of food someone will accept, whether they use the same utensils over and over again, how they eat the foods, such as eating one thing and then eating the other thing, or avoiding methods of eating, such as using cutlery um, at all. And again, we've got some pictures, of, these are to do with Rosie again. I told you about the Coke Zero before, but she also liked these mini rolls. Remember, she liked things in fours. So her dad would buy these enormous 12 packs because you know, he thought that was better saving, but Rosie liked to eat in numbers. So she would either have four or eight or 12. 
And when she was in one of her moods where she wanted to compensate and, and then she would eat that all 12 in one go. So it didn't always have a great um, impact on her really, but she had some, again, some quite strong routines about how she ate those mini rolls. Okay, I'd like to think a bit more now about um, anorexia and those those type of eating disorders and autism and just tell you a bit, bit about that because I think that's quite important particularly for women although we know that that men and people who identify as male um, do experience those eating disorders as well. So I said before we've got a really high prevalence of autism in eating disorder populations okay and if we compare that with between one to two percent in the general population you can see that's incredibly high. They tend to be these restrictive eating disorders, so something like anorexia, okay, where things are restricted. Okay, we do tend to see more females to male, although I think that picture will change over time because men with eating disorders or males with eating disorders has been under recognized in the past. And actually, when people have, when, when researchers have looked across people with eating disorders and people with autism, what they found is there are a great deal of similarity in how people are. So particularly around things like theory of mind, the ability to understand the thoughts and feelings and intentions of other people, or the social profile. So we see people that, um, for example, struggle to recognize emotions, tend to withdraw from social situations and perhaps be quite rigid. And we can see how that maps onto autism. And again, that might play out into the choice of foods. Oh, there's my crisp with the black mark on picture, by the way, folks, um, for those of you who recognize what that might do to the bowl of the crisps. Um, and quite for a long time now, researchers have looked at does anorexia and autism coexist in families? And there's some evidence to say that perhaps it does. So maybe there's something genetic going on there or that might be causing that. And, and more recently, other researchers, so Baron Cohen, some of you may have heard of him, um, have looked at sort of this idea of systemizing. So um, this idea of liking systems, how things connect. Um, I'm noticing that people with anorexia and ASD um, tend to have those kind of profiles really. Now this is a quote from a woman I was really um, privileged to share a platform with some years ago. So Kathy uh, and I did some talks together um, about eating disorders and autism and Kathy's an expert on experience and has a great deal of lived experience of, about these issues and, and I, I think this is really helpful actually understanding not just what was going on for Kathy but what might be going on for other autistic women so her issue really was that she ended up in an eating disorder unit with a diagnosis of anorexia but when you start to look at what she tells us here you can see that perhaps there were other things going on so she over exercised a lot but you can see here she's talking about how this was to relieve her anxiety it wasn't about weight loss and she had these daily exercise goals that she had to do just right the same routine every day um, and if she couldn't do that it was really really hard for her and as well as that she would make these lists of calories and what was in her food and so on and she really enjoyed that so much so that it became quite an obsessive part of of her day really and so all of this kind of controlling and restricting food uh, was a way for her to feel okay, to feel calm and to manage her stress. And I think that's absolutely crucial for many people um, in terms of setting these patterns really. So how do we know when it's ARFID? How do we know when it's anorexia? That's not always a very e easy question, but let's have a look and see if we can try and tease it out a little bit. So we've got the two labels, if you like, in ARFID, we have a great deal of anxiety about foods and meal times and this fear of the new. In anorexia, we have a very strong what's called fear of fatness, so this, this absolute terror of, of gaining weight. In ARFID, we have problems with recognizing appetite and responding to it. In anorexia, we have kind of deliberate restriction. That's a conscious I'm going to either restrict my foods or overexercise in order to lose weight. In ARFID, we see these hypersensitive sensory responses, often to the look of foods or, or the texture. And in anorexia, it's much more about having this distorted view of one's body shape and how, how that is experienced. 
<clears throat> the types of foods that we see in our food tend to be those beige carbohydrates, smooth textured foods and so on. So perhaps the biscuits and the, the fromage fray. With anorexia, it tends to be foods that are seen as healthy or low calorie because of course someone's deliberately restricting to try and lose weight. And we know that our food is more prevalent in autism. And now we're starting to understand that anorexia is more prevalent in autism as well. So you can see, although the patterns are different and perhaps they have a different basis to them, um, there's still definitely something that connects them. And the, the thing that seems to connect them is that autistic people are more at risk of having these. Um, complex eating patterns and if you are worried about particularly about anorexia and you're worried about uh, an individual restricting the amount of food they're having if they're losing weight or if they're you know seeming to be exercising a lot and, and becoming quite obsessive about that then it really please do talk to a GP or other health professional um, so let's think about how we might try and discriminate this if you like is it an eating disorder is it a disordered eating pattern how do we work this out well i guess the first thing to say is that for, for for across the board with eating disorders adolescence is always a risky time i think it's particularly risky for autistic people and particularly risky risky for autistic girls and you know we know that those pressures increase during adolescence extra anxiety is it harder for girls well I don't want to genderize it too much um, I don't think that would be right but we know that for example the internalizing presentation the masking the fitting in does seem to be more prevalent in girls and that that hiding of things is definitely a risk factor um, so we've talked a bit looking at Kathy you know around these strategies for controlling anxiety often the eating disorder is about that so it's not always about being thin that may be part of it and perhaps someone's getting quite a lot of comments or validation or even finding that they're able to socialize a bit more because people are recognizing and think, oh, you look great, you've lost weight, you know, I like what you're wearing or whatever. And maybe that's, you know, positive for them, but it isn't always about being thin. Often it's about food rules and having these routines and rituals. And of course, the underlying kind of factors that we've already talked about that we know are there in autism, the impact on food, the sensory, the, the cognitive or thinking rigidity and flexibility, ability to recognize appetite and so on. And uh, Baron Cohen particularly talks about autistic girls developing these special interests in controlling calories and weight. And I've seen that as well. And that's something that Kathy has also talked about. Um, again, that was Rosie. And, and, and I mentioned before that I first met her when she was about 15. Well, unfortunately, she was in an inpatient unit when I met her um, for an eating disorder. She'd been given this diagnosis of anorexia. But actually, when we really looked at her eating pattern, she'd always had some sensory issues around food. And what seemed to have happened as she got into her adolescence was that the stress had become overwhelming for her and controlling food had become a way of managing that so it wasn't for her it wasn't necessarily about losing weight but if, positively for Rosie she got her autism diagnosis while she was in that um, adolescent unit which was really helpful for her because it was a way of saying okay so your autism is a big factor here and and helping her work that through I'm really pleased to tell you that she did very well after that and managed to develop a really good eating pattern and lost quite a lot of this rigidity and so on. So sometimes the weight loss and the additional mental health issues does lead to um, a diagnosis of an eating disorder like anorexia, but it can lead to perhaps a bit more recognition of what's underlying that. And I, I certainly hope that we're starting to notice and pick up those patterns in eating disorder services a little bit more. But we, I still think we're at the early days of that. But I I can't stress enough folks if you're worried about it um, please seek professional help okay talking about being worried about it let's think about the impact of of these type of eating patterns and come back to our food for a second so if you remember in the diagnostic criteria we had these things around some people lose weight and so on um, so let's try and remember that the weight loss is generally minimized if we allow safe and preferred foods so for some people, there's a nutritional deficiency as well. It tends to be iron deficiency anemia. And if you think about where we get um, iron from, it's red meat, it's green leafy vegetables, and those are things that are frequently not eaten. So that's the most common one. Um, having a supplement 
is a really good idea if you can manage to get a vitamin and mineral supplement in someone that's great and also remember that a lot of foods are fortified okay so this means that they've, they've got extra things added in them so often bread is fortified quite a lot of breakfast cereals are fortified uh, yogurts and those sorts of things that are marketed to children and so on are fortified and and so on so it's worth checking the foods that um, your individual at home is having and having a look to see if that's the case and it's very rare by the way for people to have to depend on tube or enteral feeding but the problem is if we do have that situation it's, it can be incredibly difficult to remove particularly if the individual's autistic so uh, we try to avoid that wherever possible and hopefully nobody here today is having to deal with that Okay, so we've mentioned a little bit before about this idea of functioning, psychosocial functioning and the impact of that, oops, sorry, the impact of that on people. So of course it has a huge impact on individuals and on the child, although often it's more on the parent and the family when the child is quite young. You're the ones who are worrying about it more. Um, for older people, it can be very self-conscious, very limiting, social eating can be a nightmare. Um, and let's be honest, Autistic young people are already challenged in those directions, so they don't need anything extra to, to make them feel different, do they, or exclude them from those situations. And of course, those worries about health, growth and nutrition and where to get the foods from can be really difficult for families. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about sort of risk as well and impact. And I don't want to, to scare anybody here, okay? But it's really important to remember that we tend to see these eating problems in autistic people being perhaps at the more severe end um, than they are in people who don't have autism, okay? And it's because, you know, people with autism are dealing with this kind of cumulative effect of all these things that kind of pile up, the sensory, the cognitive, the anxiety, you know, all of that stuff. And it does tend to mean that they can be, you know, quite risky. And I, I, I always want to kind of raise that when I do groups like this, just because I want you to, make sure you reach out to anyone that you can do in your professional networks to get the right help, okay? I think particularly for females, and again, I don't want to genderize it too much because we know that young men can, and, and people who identify as male can mask as well, but there's something about getting a later diagnosis, perhaps into later adolescence or into adulthood that can, that can trigger, um, a lack of understanding and more stress and then more of these eating problems. They are, tend to be more complex in autism. Like I said, there's a kind of a layering effect where uh, things kind of build up. And, um, and we know that our young people are more vulnerable generally. So, you know, that there is that factor as well. Unfortunately, any type of eating problem has a poor health, social or educational outcome. So um, we have to try and avoid that wherever possible. Um, parental stress and anxiety is huge in this area as well, folks. Okay, so if you feel worried, if you feel um, that you don't know how to manage things, maybe you're even feeling like something you're doing is wrong, you're blaming yourself, your confidence is being affected. That's that's a really common outcome of having a child or a young person who doesn't eat well. Okay, and it's really important for you to try and recognize that and to try and build that up for yourself. The other unfortunate thing to say about eating disorders in autistic people is they're much less, less likely to benefit from the treatments that we currently have. And remember that the treatments that we currently have um, that have been sort of recognised as being evidence based are often talking based. OK, so family therapy or cognitive behavioural therapy, for example. And we know that those may not be necessarily the right ways for autistic people. So at the moment, we don't have much in the way of, an, of knowledge or guidelines or specialist treatment. And it's really important that we all recognize the kind of touch points where things can be, um, can be particularly risky. So any transition uh, in adolescence, you know, uh, especially during puberty and things like bullying are all known risk factors for, to, for further worsening or the development of an eating disorder. So it's just worth remembering that, but I don't want to scare anybody, okay. And um, let's say a little bit more about what it's like for you folks out there. So anxiety about eating is just universal, okay. I, I've worked in many different sorts of areas in my career as a psychologist, and this is the, the, the area that I always find, parents find the hardest, okay. And it's to do with 
it's to do with this thing here, that providing nutrition is your absolute fundamental responsibility as a parent. And if that isn't going right, then of course you're going to feel like that. And like you said before, it impacts on your self-esteem, your, your self-efficacy, so that's how you feel you can cope and your confidence. But worse than that, and this is particularly worrying, I think, so parents of children who have an eating problem feel like it's their fault, okay? So if you felt like that, my heart goes out to you, it really does. 100% um, across the board, that never happens, okay? Of course, occasionally there are families where, you know, things are happening and that's causing additional problems, but generally almost across the board, a feeding problem is occurring because of something that's going on in the child's development, <clears throat> in this case, autism, and, you know, it's not to do with what you're doing or not doing, okay? And, uh, you know, I always tell professionals that it's our job to address this and to be really um, key about it. I just wanted to add to that because I think lockdown has really not helped and I'm glad that we're kind of coming out of all of that now it seems but it's worth remembering just in case we have to ever go through this again that you know it's been challenging for people because of course there's extra stress there's changes to routines but also how do you get those foods I remember thinking when the pasta shortage happened oh my goodness what are the families going to do where that's their staple food you know, so I, I just think it must have been a terrible time for people. And of course, any increase in anxiety leads to an increase in sensory issues. And, and those two things are very connected. And then, of course, someone's more likely to notice changes to their foods, to refuse or to drop a food from the diet and to lose weight. So really, at those times, always allow the preferred food. Try to keep to your regular schedules if you can. Check weight if you're worried and supplement if possible. And most of all, try not to panic, because particularly with children, most children pick up when the stress is reduced and hopefully when life returns to some kind of normality. OK, so if um, if I'm not hammering this one home enough, please read this on the screen now. OK, and take this as your take home message. Uh, it's not the fault of parents. OK, this eating pattern develops connected to these characteristics of autism and um, how they build on each other. Okay. All right, I'd like to move on now and talk about what we do about things, okay, because that's always a popular part of these talks. Um, and I'm going to start with some principles, okay, because what I can't do today, unfortunately, is give you specifics for your child or your young person, um, because A, there's too many of us to do that, but B, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to give that kind of advice when well, I don't know your family, I don't know your child. Um, but actually, because we know that every autistic person is different to the next autistic person, we need strategies that we can um, adapt, flex a little bit. You know, we need kind of a group of them. I talk about a toolbox quite a bit, a toolbox approach, so that you can kind of think what would work in my family, in my context, for my child. OK, so what I'm going to try and give you is some principles that hopefully you can take away and think about. OK, so. The first one, you'll be happy to know that we've done that today, hopefully. So number one, it's really important to understand what causes these restricted eating patterns in autism. OK, so hopefully you've managed to do some of that and increase your understanding of it. The next thing we have to do is understand the impact of that on the individual. OK, because ARFID and, and uh, any eating pattern like that, including some of the more risky ones like anorexia, you know, tends to be quite individual. So for example, you might find for your child, managing the smell part of it is the really hard thing for them. But for somebody else's child, it might be more about texture or it might be more about the fear of those foods changing and looking different. Um, so it's really important that you kind of kind of get your head around where is your child in in that sense it's like it's like a spectrum of eating behaviors a bit like autism is a is a complex spectrum okay and if you're in a situation where i put manage autism in inverted commas what i mean by that is that if, if you're in a setting where uh your child your individual isn't in the right educational setting for example they're not well supported with routines and autism friendly strategies then there's absolutely no point trying to manage the eating until that's more settled okay because if we think about 
autism and we think about those characteristics of autism that are impacting on the eating, sensory anxiety, all of that, rigidity and so on, then of course, if that isn't in some way well supported, then of course, the eating patterns are only going to get worse. Do you see what I mean? So um, that's really important. So do that groundwork first, if that makes sense. Okay, one of the things I spend a lot of time doing is trying to dispel myths that exist about this eating pattern and educating families. Okay, that's a really important thing for us to do. And hopefully you've received a bit of that tonight. But I'm gonna talk about myths coming up in a second. Um, and hopefully you'll feel confident and empowered enough to perhaps talk to professionals about it or talk to your child's school about it if you feel something needs to change there. And another principle I want to give you is that we always start from where the child currently is, if that makes sense. So wherever they are in their eating pattern, even if it's only one or two foods, if it's really very restricted, you know, and you feel really this is, you know, really as, as bad as it's ever been, then we start from that point and we choose where to, where to intervene, where we think we're going to get the best chance of success. Okay. And that might be something really small. It might be something about just helping that child to have a little bit more of a preferred food or to be able to um, eat something in school, maybe to, so they can manage the school day, or maybe it's about adding just one extra food in the diet, but something that can be quite small can have quite a big impact, okay? So, so it's really important to just think, all right, this is where we are now, how do we move forward? Does that make sense? I hope it does. And um, I like to think about this idea of a stepped intervention process so we do one thing and then we build on that with the next thing and the next thing and the next thing okay and I think for autistic children particularly and for adults as well you may need the help of other professionals um, in in going forward in that and like I said I like to think about this idea as a bit of an adaptable toolkit that you can take thinking about other professionals that you might want to go to there's a list on here um, they're in alphabetical order, by the way. It's not that I think psychologists should be at the top. It just, that's just in alphabetical order. But it gives you a bit of an idea of the sorts of professionals who might work in this area and why you might go to them, if that makes sense, what they can do for you if you can get to see them. So um, hopefully that's helpful as well. OK, I mentioned myths before, so let's just get rid of some of these. Um, autistic children and those with ARFID don't grow out of it. OK, generally people grow up to have a similar eating pattern in adulthood, although there are lots of opportunities to improve it. OK, but we think ARFID may be uh, another neurodevelopmental condition, meaning that it's something that seems to happen during development. And actually, by the way, you can have ARFID and not have autism. OK, so we know that whilst it may be connected to autism, it isn't just autistic people who have it. So we think it might be one of these neurodevelopmental conditions. And if that is the case, then you know, obviously we can't alter someone's development, but there is a lot we can do to improve things as people get older, okay? So people don't grow out of it. So no spontaneous just change just because you're older. People don't eat eventually when hungry, and that's because of that appetite recognition idea. People don't eat just because others are eating, okay? And that's partly to do with some of the social differences in autism, but also, actually, this can be a strategy that works the opposite way around. You can put an autistic person in with other people eating and just make them feel so bad, so sick, or so, so much like they need to leave the room that it can just have a really lasting and then really unpleasant impact on them. Don't eat when rewarded. I'll say a bit about rewards coming up. Um, and don't just eat junk food, okay? And you may have heard people talk about, oh, your child just eats junk food, or et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm gonna try and rebrand that for you um, to, to get you to think about calories and why calories are important, okay? So no such thing as junk food for any child with a restricted eating pattern, okay? What we want for these children are what we're gonna call high calorie per mouthful foods or something similar, okay? like these sorts of foods, like the chocolate, like the crisps, et cetera. These are extremely useful for children who only eat a small amount and who are at risk of becoming underweight, okay? So we do see some children with restricted eating patterns who do put weight on, 
okay? Uh, they're the ones generally don't respond to feelings of being full, okay? But for those, for the majority, because the majority is the other way around, uh, for those children, we need to um, get them to have something uh, regularly, okay? So this might be having something in school, even if it's something that isn't recognized as a healthy eating option, we need to do that, okay? And bear in mind that something like ARFID, it's a recognized eating disorder, it should bring an inclusion agenda as well so schools should be able to respond to it okay all right i'm going to talk through what i'm calling practice-based interventions now so these are ones that we've collected over the years from folks like yourselves from looking at the research and from clinical practice that i've been doing for years uh, and with colleagues and it's really good i always think to start with the what what you don't do because the more you understand what not to do it helps us uh, remember what to do if that makes sense so we don't pressure or force, and there's a, a small child being forced into eating something she doesn't want to do. That's the daughter of a friend of mine, by the way, uh, looking quite miserable. Pressure and forcing just leads to lifelong refusal of particular foods, uh, and it's just aversive and unpleasant. And remember that anything stressful uh, around feeding can cause us to, to stop eating, basically, so it just doesn't work. We don't hide in disguised foods. Remember the contamination response. If I hid something in your favorite food, you're unlikely to accept something unpleasant or in your favorite food. If you spot that, which you probably are going to, and if you're particularly sensory sensitive, you're definitely going to spot it. You're unlikely to accept me giving you food again. So it's a pointless strategy. We don't make people sit with the new and unaccepted food for long periods of time because that just doesn't mean the food gets accepted. OK, I'll give you an example. This is gooseberry crumble. My mum made that when I was about eight years old. I liked crumble, never had gooseberries before. So I bit into it. Crumble, great. Gooseberries, awful. Bitter, grainy, just unpleasant. I said to my mum, I'm not eating that. My mum said, you'll sit at the table until it's finished. There are starving children in Africa. They grew up in the 70s. It was the thing that mum said back then. I sat there for two hours in this standoff with my mum. And I can't remember who gave up, but eventually one of us gave up. But I haven't eaten gooseberries since, and you won't get me to eat them. OK, and I'm sure you can all recall a food that perhaps you might have been forced to eat or told to sit in front of. And it just doesn't work. So that's the, that's the danger with things like learning plates. I'm not saying they don't always work. Sometimes they might for some people, but it, you know, putting a food in front of someone that you haven't really carefully thought about can have all kinds of risks because it might trigger those disgust responses that we were talking about before. OK, we don't need people to go hungry. And I think we've already covered why we don't do that. And I mentioned rewards a little while ago. It's hard to see this pie chart. Hopefully you can see it a little bit. But these are foods that are given as rewards. So we generally give things like chocolate and biscuits, cakes and sweets. Um, and we often give those foods after eating something else. So eat up your greens and then you can have your pudding. OK, the problem with that is that we're on the one hand, we are saying this food, the pudding is the better food because you're having that next. You eat this thing up quick so you can have that. So we're sort of valuing that food somehow. Um, there's another problem with the rewards with autistic people is that a reward doesn't always compute with them. So that sort of idea of I do this and then something follows doesn't always match up. And also, if you're really disgusted by something, there's no reward in the world that's going to help you eat it. So it's a pointless strategy. So don't use food as rewards, folks. OK. All right. Let's talk about what we do do. I'm going to put a list up here. So we allow safe foods, whatever those are. We reassure families. We try to get into a regular eating schedule. We try to increase sensory tolerance. We try to reduce anxiety and stress. We try to add to the range of foods and wherever possible, we try to get a new food in. OK, so I'm going to talk you through those in more detail. So I think we've already covered this, really, but allowing safe foods means that it helps the child to regulate that intake. OK, so to get the right number of calories in. Um, so energy intake is always our number one priority. And if you're in a situation where your child is losing weight or your individual is losing weight, then just go back to those most preferred foods, okay? Um, that's not the time to be trying to add things to the range or getting them to have something new, okay? So number one, always allow these preferred foods because it will maintain your child's expected growth pattern. And it shouldn't matter what those foods are. 
Okay, might be a little challenging for some of you, but I tend to find that, to hear that, sorry, but I tend to find that most families have got to this point. You know, they've had their battles, they've tried other ways of doing things, and then they realise this is the best way forward. So most of the time, you found your way there yourself. Okay, so scheduling, oh, I was about to say the reassuring, hang on, so where we go? Here we go. Reassuring families. So just to hammer this one home as well, this is how we do it. We educate families. We talk to them about what this eating pack is connected to and reassure them that it isn't their fault. And that, I, I have to say, is, is a very powerful thing when families are able to take that message. OK, in terms of scheduling, what we want to try and do is get to a point where someone isn't compensating for lost calories and they're having something quite regularly because this over time will help them build up a recognition of when they're hungry or when they're full okay and it also helps sort of appetite just you know the, the brain and the, and the stomach to kind of work together and get the, the kind of calorie load stable so that people can concentrate at school and have the right energy levels and so on if that makes sense so all that hangry you've heard of that expression you know someone's angry because they're hungry you know to try and avoid that kind of thing okay so i would say you need regular meal and snack times uh, rather than grazing, if you can do it, about six a day is good. So you've got a breakfast, mid-morning, lunch, mid-afternoon, tea time, something before bed. So around about six times, space them out, never more than two or three hours without one of those opportunities, which means something has to happen at school or college or nursery um, so that they're allowing that as well, which is why this rebranding of foods and trying to get people to allow those foods in is really important okay and that will help your child grow but it will also manage their energy levels okay so the next thing that we might be looking to do is increasing sensory tolerance okay so this is minimizing overload finding a quiet place to eat not eating in the dining hall i love these little pop-up tents you can get i've met, I've met a few families over the years who've used that in their in their home so the child can have a sort of contained space to eat in. I know it's not everyone sitting at the table, but actually that doesn't matter. What matters is your child's eating well and is comfortable and happy. Okay, so any way you can achieve that is, is, is good. Okay, we also have found a lot of success over the years of helping children desensitize. So that's building up their exposure to something bit by bit. So the idea being kind of messy play idea, but you can do that in an age appropriate way with food preparation and cooking and so on. As long as the goal isn't to just eat the food at the end, it's more about getting involved in food, being around those smells or things that way they look and so on. And this resource is really good. Okay, so some colleagues of mine at uh, De Montford University have developed this sensory play toolkit. It's lots of games and things you can play with school aged children. Um, to help them desensitize and you can go on that website download it for free and have a go okay if we're thinking about texture sensitivity particularly there are lots of different textures i'm putting them up on screen as we talk okay and these are kind of the textures that if you were weaning a child uh, a baby from milk through to food you might be thinking about and i think it's really important when we're thinking about texture sensitivity for you to try and think about where your child or your individual might be on this kind of spectrum, really. Um, because if they're up at the top end there, they're really only having pureed foods or smooth foods, and perhaps some of these foods that kind of bite and dissolve or, or are kind of mashed up, then it's gonna be quite a jump for them to manage things like raw apple or, you know, the, the harder to chew food. So really you do have to kind of go through a stage of desensitizing someone in that way. But the, the reference at the bottom of the screen is really good for helping you understand texture sensitivity and um, ways in which to manage that. So the Infant and Toddler Forum has lots of downloadable fact sheets all about eating and so on. And it, it is intended for younger children, but actually I think if you have an autistic child or even adolescent, they're still quite helpful because it does explain a lot of the, the sorts of things we've been talking about today. With older children, we tend to find that the visual stuff is the hardest for them. So the way food looks is really difficult. So they can get really stuck on the packaging, the branding, whether something's got a black mark on it or not. And so you can play around a bit with this. Can you take the packaging off, for example? Could the child still identify the food? If so, do they do it by sight? Is it the smell? Is it only when they get to taste it? You can sort of experiment a bit with that. 
um, to see if you can kind of bridge them onto um, different examples so that they've got some of that generalization going on. We call it spreading the sets, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I want to say a bit about sort of how you manage the opposite of hypersensitivity, really, which is the, the being undersensitive, the hyposensitivity. And, and, you know, and some of the things that we might see, are, like we said before, not noticing being full, perhaps taking other people's foods, being over responsive to, to food, which might cause weight gain, overstuffing the mouth and so on. And this is where we sometimes have to be a bit more controlling. Um, managing portion sizes, perhaps using things like plate guards, which divide a plate up, or even providing some more sort of sensory stimulation for people. Okay, and as part of that, let's have a think about pica, because if we think pica might be might be one of these sensory seeking behaviours, then how do we manage that? Uh, one of the key things to say is that it's actually quite easy to increase pica if we're not careful. So. If we try to prevent people, for example, from engaging in PICA, sometimes they become more motivated to do it. So we have to have a balance how we do that. The better way to manage it, I think, is to think about the underlying causes. OK, so if we think about stress and anxiety, people tend to engage in PICA more when they're stressed and anxiety and experiencing anxiety. So this is where we could offer alternative self-soothing activities alternatives to uh, to the things that they're eating so safe edible materials um, you can get these chewy buddies and things like that that are perfectly safe to to munch on some of them are even flavored um, and I, I would suggest if you have someone who's engaging in pika do seek medical help because it's important your GP knows that they do that and is able to to provide some checks and so on and um, you know knowing what your child is eating as well is really important because there are some items that could be quite dangerous. So it's always important to do that. And I've got a picture on the screen here of James. Unfortunately, James died as a result of his pica. And I, I um, some years ago were, was involved with the family. Um, unfortunately, only after James died as part of his inquest, but the family asked me to share his story wherever I go. So I always show that picture of James. We've written some articles together, the references on the screen there. Um, and I think his story, um, if you're interested reading about that, um, is, is, you know, is quite enlightening, really. And the family um, have worked very hard to um, try to promote awareness about Pika. OK. And some of the things that came out of, of his very early and tragic death, I'm afraid, were some ideas that hopefully are going to become more embedded in guidance, maybe even... Um, in further legislation down the road. So sort of monitoring what people have and how we might do that, how we might manage environments around um, PICA. So that might be restricting access if possible, but um, recognizing that sometimes that makes people more motivated. Providing meaningful alternative activities instead of restricting their access can be better. And medical checks, this is one area that I think we could move very well in really getting those annual health checks to include certain things if people are engaging in people like blood tests and so on and managing those um, sensory and anxiety issues so providing safe alternatives and making sure people are well regulated okay um moving on to our more restricted pattern again so we're on to kind of reducing anxiety and meal time stress now so again it's about allowing those preferred foods, but in familiar routines as well. OK, so whatever it is that enables your child to eat the best, allow them to do it. OK, even if that's them eating alone, it's OK to do that. The goal is that they're going to eat well and that you're going to feel relaxed about that. Anything that will sensory calm your child will help with anxiety. Uh, we've had a bit of success over the years with using very simple relaxation techniques, deep breathing, a little bit of imaginative visual visualization, some, some of the sort of mindfulness techniques. So there are lots of apps and things you can get for that. So you don't have to learn it yourself. You can just download something and help your child to access it. Um, and we were talking before about these anxiety systems that build up around families you know, that's our family anxiety system. And I said before, this is the place that we change it. We break the cycle by reassuring families and educating them about the fact this isn't their fault, that it's connected to these characteristics of autism, okay. 
Other ways you can reduce anxiety and mealtime stress is to use distraction, okay? So when we're distracted, we're not paying attention as much to what's going on around us. And in terms of food, we're not like hyper vigilant, meaning we're just constantly looking for small changes to our food. And this is quite good for either a specific meal or if you're trying to get a new food in, you can set uh, a little goal to do it. And it's where we pair eating with another activity, such as watching something, listening to something and so on. And, and the key is that you allow the child to watch the thing and eat at the same time, but you have to be prepared to end the distraction if the child goes off task, okay? So it's not just plonking them in front of the TV and, and off you go. Um, although that may work for some, for some families. And actually this technique came out of families saying to me for years, my child eats better in front of the iPad, the telly, whatever. And we've kind of worked out why that was, why that was the case. So, you know, you can set it as a, as a task, no more than 20 minutes, I would say. Uh, so a short pepper pig or whatever it is your young person's into. And they generally if allowed to do that. The eating and the task kind of get paired and that seems to work. OK, and over time, we know that it reduces anxiety and increases intake. So uh, it does work. I can promise you that. I mentioned before I was going to show you some things around PDA and how we manage that. Um, this is off the. Uh, PDA Society website, okay, they have the, what they call their panda, and um, you'll see that the P uh, and the letters and so on all stand for various bits of the um, the, the panda, uh, an acronym, okay, so we've got things like setting the smart, pick your battles, set your smart goals, one step at a time, manage anxiety, negotiate so that's trying to lower demands by kind of trying to involve that young person in being in a bit more control and i'll show you why i've got those pictures up in a second um, disguise and manage demands by kind of balancing them and contracting and so on and and make those adaptations where necessary so for autism that might be visual aid so it's kind of shifting how we might manage things okay Let's move on to thinking about how you might add a food in. Okay, so if we're thinking about increasing the range, what we try to do is start with a food that is already accepted within what we might call is a known category. So let's use the example of, of crisps, so the crisp category. So perhaps your child only accepts one type of crisp in a particular packaging, particular brand, etc. Can you generalize it to a different brand, different packaging and so on? So we've got a packaging change here, and then we've got some new flavors and shapes. And you kind of go one step at a time, if that makes sense. Now, sometimes families say to me, why would we want to do that? I don't want them eating more crisps. I'd like them to try something like a vegetable, perhaps. Um, and I totally understand that. I really, you know, I do get that. But this is a start, folks, okay? And it does a number of things for you. Number one, it gives you a backup in case, for some reason, your child drops the food from their diet. So, you know, they eat the crisp and eat them for a long time. And then what tends to happen is the brain might signal a kind of boredom response and then that food just drops out. And if you haven't got a few examples, then you've lost the food, do you see what I mean? So it does give you this kind of backup. And um, over time, it increases flexibility, okay? Because it's a way of teaching the child that they can cope with some of that difference. And you're also doing some desensitization and kind of generalizing work as you do that. Okay, so it really does have uh, lots of advantages and, and can help lead to bigger changes over time. And there's my chip example. You know, if you can, if you only accept one type of chip, is it possible to try and generalize so that your child can accept different types? And chips are a brilliant food because you can get them anywhere and they're portable and they're a, you know, a typical food that adolescents might like to have, for example. And, and this is Joe. So Joe was about 12 when I met him. And those are some of his foods. They fit that range we were talking about earlier on. And here are some other foods that we got Joe to eat. And you can kind of see how they're generalizing across. So he wanted a different breakfast cereal. He liked the strawberry flavor. So that, that's how he got the strawberry breakfast cereal in. And then from strawberry breakfast cereal, he went to a strawberry jam sandwich. And he wanted a different crisp. So we tried those. 
they were too salty, we tried these ones, they were too greasy, and eventually we got to these ones, which he liked. And when you look at the foods, you can see we've added some new ones. And yes, they're in similar categories. But what Joe has learned is that he can generalize a bit, he can add things, he can have a bit of success. And, you know, it's going to, over time, help him be more flexible and hopefully more motivated as well. You can do it in a sort of different way as well by kind of helping young people to understand this food is the same as that food or similar. OK, it, it kind of helps with those categories. So a baked potato can be similar to mashed potato, for example. And I think it's often really well done if you do it with real foods or with pictures of foods, for example. OK, and then if we're getting to the point where someone may be ready to try a new food, there's a couple of ways in which to do that. OK, so. Picking a food that is similar and or motivating is the key. OK, and some of the good reasons for a motivating food could be other people eat it, their peer group eat it. There's a particular reason they want to eat it. And here are some examples here. So Rachel wanted to eat toast because she wanted a sleepover food. Charlie wanted to eat pizza because he fancied taking a girl from college to a pizza restaurant because he thought that would be a good thing that he needed to be able to eat pizza. And then those other ideas around, you know, why chips, for example, might be good in terms of um, the applicability, where you can get them from, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the more motivated somebody is, um, the more it will help them overcome their anxiety about trying something different. And it's really important that we don't choose the foods as parents or professionals, okay? So let me just, uh, show you this. So Joe, that I was talking about a minute ago, wanted to try cashew nuts. And after he did, he said, I like the dry and not too salty. His mum wanted him to try these raisins. And he said that it looked like rabbit poo. So, you know, sometimes we get we get it wrong, basically. So if, if you're able to do this with someone, uh, it's really important you ask them what they think they might like to try. Um, it's important to remember as well that most of us are more likely to try something away from home, away from our normal routines and habits. OK, and the other thing to say is that often people with autism eat specific to a context. They may have foods they only eat at school, foods they only eat at home, foods they only eat at grandma's, for example, which can be quite rigid. OK, but we can use that. It means sometimes if we add a new context, you can sometimes get a new food in. And I've seen that time and time again with families. So it's about new routine happening and a food opportunity being offered as part of that. Um, perhaps taking a new route home from school and dropping off somewhere at a shop or a cafe, doing a new activity in school that involves having some a snack or something. You go to the swimming pool, you go to the swimming pool cafe afterwards and have the chocolate fudge cake, that idea. Um, the food is likely to stay in that context, okay, so it may not transfer to another place, but over the course of that child's week or that individual's week, it can increase the whole range. Okay, the other way we might try a new food is by what we call a taste trial. It's like an experiment with food. Um, I've almost finished, by the way, Cathy. We're, we're not going to have a huge amount of time for questions, but we could take some. I don't mind hanging on a bit for those who want to. Um, or, like we said, we could, we could do it via kind of an email thing uh, where I can provide. Yeah, we'll, we'll work it out, team. don't worry. Yeah, I thought we would. Um, a taste trial. OK, so it's like an experiment with food. Um, before we start something like this, we have to think about is somebody ready for it? OK, and readiness really comes with age. So with this pattern of eating, people, particularly as they get into their adolescent years, are often more likely to be ready to have something new so uh, and do it in this way okay so this is a really good thing with teenagers I find um, so first of all you choose the food and we've just talked about how to do that or how not to do it usually someone will need some of that exposure or des desensitization to it so that might be just looking at it seeing you play with it touch it you know sitting next to somebody having it just naturally getting used to it perhaps preparing it even um, we may need to do a bit of immediate anxiety reduction as someone does that because of course when you're doing something new it can raise your stress levels so anything that can bring that down will be good and obviously you have to actually try the food but not only do you have to try it once you have to take it more than once in fact you may need to do it as many as 10 to 14 times research suggests that it takes quite a few exposures to be able to put that food into your diet 
um, like I said, suitable for older young people. Do it as a separate activity away from meals because meal times are around calories and around, you know, just getting those important foods in. This is kind of like an activity to be done away from meals. And like I said, a small amount frequently to see how that goes through. And, and the most important thing really is to rate the food. So I've got a little rating scale here. And if you rate it after you've tried it, you get a sense of how someone's progressing. So if it's a three on the first go, that's not brilliant. In fact, maybe you need to choose a different food. But if you're more like a five or even a six, then that's really good as a start. And you'll probably find that that rating increases over time. So the choosing of the food is really important there, okay? Um, because that really does give the young person the best chance of success. Okay, so just to summarize, we talked about a spectrum of eating issues in the autism spectrum and about how they're connected to autism through those sensory anxiety and cognitive differences that we see. 100% folks, please take this message home with you. It's not your fault, okay? It's connected to those things that we've talked about. Even if you're in those family cycles of, of stress, it's still not your fault. You're just reacting. You're just trying to find the way through for your young person, okay? And trying to do the best for them. We know that, okay? You generally need a range of things to do because you know everyone's different, but also depending on the context and situation you find yourself in, you know, your child might need different strategies as well. And please try to get support and help wherever you can. I know that's not easy, but go to your GP, ask them what's happening um, in local areas about these type of eating patterns. And just to highlight a few um, resources that you might find useful. So we talked about the sensory toolkit and the infant and toddler forum. Um, I should have changed that reference, Kathy. The network autism has kind of gone now, but if you, it's all on the National Autistic Society's website. If you go on their website, you can Google about eating. There's a loads and loads of great stuff on there. Um, and then the last one is RFID Awareness UK. It's a relatively new char charity set up by a couple of parents, one of whom has an autistic son. And it's a great place to go to for all kinds of information about this restricted eating pattern. Okay, and I have got a little advert for the book up there as well. So I wrote a book with a colleague of mine a couple of years ago that's done quite well. Brilliant, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing now, Cathy. Whistle stop, we're just on half nine as well. So I am sorry that we've gone right up to the wire there. <laughs> Kathy, you need to unmute. <laughs> She's waving the book around. Oh, yeah, I was waving the book. Sorry, that's that's yeah. the book in the wild in, in my yeah. house. Yeah. Um, so we've got time for just a few questions. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, guys, I that we haven't had too much time for questions, but we have um, recorded most of them. Um, yeah. And we will I will send them to Liz and make her work overtime. Mm. <laughs> you know, I don't mind, Kathy. You know, and I then we'll mind. email them to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I just take a few. Mm. Um, I've got yeah. a feeling that my dogs might break in in a minute. So if there's a loud yeah. noise, I do apologise. Um, should, um, hang on, where am I in my list? Um, is it possible to have ARFID in childhood and then later develop anorexia in teenage years? Unfortunately, it is. One thing doesn't lead to the other, I'm afraid. OK, so that's important to say. They're different. So if you have ARFID, it doesn't mean you're going to get anorexia. Do you see what I mean? But I think if, if you're talking about an autistic person, then there's a risk of them developing both. Do you see what I mean? So I would say in the non-autistic population, that probably wouldn't happen as much. But in the autistic population, it could definitely happen more. And that's because, you know, we just know that people are more at risk of developing those eating problems because they've got a kind of a, you know, a layering of the things that, can cause them. Does that make sense? So makes I suppose absolute sense. try not to worry about that happening, but keep your eye on anything that might be going on that you start to think, hang on a minute, there's something more happening here. Do you see what I mean? Because the earlier you can try and get help, the better. So I don't want to worry anybody, try not to, but just keep your eye on what the, si the signs might be. Mm. Okay. Um, and I should say, if anyone needs to go, please do go and we will get the questions answered and we will send yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, one that came up quite a lot was yeah. how do people get um, referred for ARFID? Yeah. How do people get treatment for ARFID? Yeah. You know, as we both know, <laughs> there's, there's yeah. not a lot out there on the NHS. No. It, it, it kind of depends where you live at the moment. There's a very patchy across the country kind of national picture. Um, OK, so in some areas, services are developing quite well. So there's a few services in London, for example. South London and Maudsley Hospital have an ARFID service. Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital have one. I think there are some up in the northwest as well, but in other areas, not so much. And uh, I'm in Coventry and Warwickshire. I mentioned that before. We're, we're starting to develop our pathways at the moment. So, you know, it's quite patchy, folks. So I think the best thing to do is go to your GP. Now, not all GPs have heard of it. Okay, so if you can, take, take Google it get the criteria or take, you know, if you can take a snapshot of this talk perhaps and say, look, you know, I think my child might have this, what's happening? You know, what can you do? Where can you go? Um, sometimes the CAMS help you, child and adolescent mental health. Sometimes it's more like an eating disorder service, but it, it does seem quite patchy. I would hope if your child's autistic and you've got some connection to your local autism services, whether that's statutory or, a charity or whatever, um, they ought to know a bit more about it because it's so common. Do you see what I mean? But I think it's quite patchy. So badger your GP would be my advice. Okay. Um, I think probably I'm not going to say that question because I think you've answered it. Um, there's a question here about eating in school. I know mm. you did, you covered it a little bit, um, but what do you do if your child won't eat in school at all? Yeah, yeah um, that's yeah, that's really tricky, actually. Um, and lots of children are like that. And, you know, it, school can be a really difficult place for eating for all the things that we know about the, the you know, high levels of stress and the sensory stuff and so on. Um, I think it's really important to have a sit down meeting with, with the teaching staff or SENCO um, and talk about it because it's not OK for a child to go all day without eating in school. Whilst they may manage it, it's not OK, if you see what I mean. You know, it's not they need regular, you know, nutrition in order to be able to concentrate, fulfill their potential, have the right energy levels and so on. And so I think, number one, I talked to the school about is there something that your child may accept in school that they could have, you know, small amounts of a preferred food and if the child if the school is okay about that then that might be the way in if you absolutely can't get them to eat anything then maybe concentrate on drinking because keeping up hydration is really important so and if if they won't drink in school then that's the one to focus on the most I think but a sit down meeting with the school staff you know your class teacher the Senko and to kind of start to understand the problem a little bit more uh, sometimes it's as simple as, you know, it's OK if they eat in the classroom. And actually, I've seen that work loads of times, that the problem is the noisy dining room or the problem is, you know, the smells and sights of other people eating. And if you can eliminate that, then things can often go much better. So, yeah, talk to the school um, about it. Mm. My, I have to say, my daughter didn't eat in school for about two years. And yeah. the way that we the way that we had to deal with it we didn't really have any choice um was that I would try to get her to eat something for breakfast that didn't yeah. always work but if she didn't or in any case mm -hmm. as soon as I picked her up from school I would have uh, an yeah. array of of possible snacks yeah. and things yeah. that she could eat um, yeah. and that was how we dealt with it yeah but, absolutely you know, it's, there's no I don't think there's any right or wrong yeah. answer here it's whatever works no. for you. I mean, it, the, the, the most important thing to say, it's not dangerous to go six hours without eating, okay? It, it isn't dangerous. But the danger is in hydration, okay? So, you know, we get dehydrated much quicker than we starve. So, you know, that's the thing to keep an eye on. So, you know, people can go that amount of time. When I say it's not okay, I think what I mean is that, you know, it's, it's an issue that should be looked at by the school, you know, to try and accommodate and find a way through, because it is much better if your child can have something um, just for their learning, basically, and their energy levels and all yeah. of that stuff. You know, and there's, a, there's a question that's just come up that I am going to I am going to jump in here, even though it's mm. a new question, because it, it fits. Um, should help for ARFID be on an EHCP? Oh, interesting. I've occasionally seen it on one. So um, I think it's a I guess it depends how the RFID fits in the profile of your child's overall 
you know, presentation really. So if that for you is the main thing that they need support for, then absolutely it should be in the HCP. And I have yeah, seen it I, here in a few. Yeah. I think what the key will be in in arranging the EHCP, the key will be in having professional evidence that yeah. the RFID is affecting your child's education. Absolutely. When yeah. you've got that written evidence in a report, yeah. then yeah. You, it doesn't it doesn't really matter what the yeah. LA says. You can yeah. want even if you have to get to tribunal, you can get it into the EHCP, yeah. but you do need that evidence. You do. You're right, Kathy. And it's the impact, isn't it? It's about demonstrating the impact. And yeah. Schools sometimes say, oh, but that doesn't affect learning. Well, no, no, it does. OK, you know, it really does affect learning if you're not getting adequate nutrition. We know that. And there's plenty of evidence that that looks at that so you can connect it. See what I mean? Mm. Yeah. OK, um, next mm. question. And I'll probably only do a couple more because I know we are running quite late now. Um, if your child is deficient yeah. in vitamins or minerals or something, but yeah. you can't get it into them because they won't take tablets yeah. or, you know, whatever mm. it might be. How mm. do you get them to take the yeah. vitamins? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, actually. I mean, uh, the first thing to say is, is get the deficiency, if you can, checked out. So that means a GP dietitian usually, who could look at the diet and tell you where there's likely to be deficiencies. Because I think it's really important to know what you're managing, what you're dealing with there because there are different things you can get that might be um, that might be applicable. So for example, I know that there's um, a type of water you can get that has iron added to it and it's meant to be completely tasteless and odorless. Can't remember if the life, life of me what it's called, um, but other families have recommended it to me. So if you have an iron deficiency, maybe you can manage with that one, if that makes sense. So I think treat it, treat getting a supplement in like you might try with a new food. Think about, what textures my child copes with, what flavours they cope with, I know, um, could they manage swallowing something or would it need to be a liquid, does it need to be one of the ones that are a bit like a sweet, there are lots of ones you can get now, so it's quite easy to kind of try a few if that makes sense or to experiment a little bit, but if you think, yeah, what does my child currently accept in the way of flavour, texture, you know, that kind of thing, um, do they, do they currently accept a medicine of some kind? Some children do, some children don't. Did a whole piece of work once with a little girl around a, a pink supplement. She liked Peppa Pig, pink was a thing. So we worked a lot on pink and we managed to get it in that way. So sometimes you have to be quite creative about it. Um, but think sensory, think about the anxiety about taking something. And if you think about the, the whole, how do you get a new food and it, is it possible to do it that way? But number one, if you can get a dietitian to tell you what the, likely deficiencies you, your child might have that really helps because then you can target that in uh, a more kind of scientific way if that makes sense yeah um here's a question really about i suppose when a family is in crisis or when a child or young person is in crisis or you feel that they're in crisis but mm. uh, you are told that their bmi isn't low enough mm. to be to be yeah. admitted or to get treatment where do you go from there? Oh, that is really hard. I really feel for whoever's asked that. That must be very worrying. Um, yeah, I guess it's about trying to understand what's happened with the BMI. Um, for people who don't know what BMI is, it's, it's just your sort of height to weight ratio. So um, it, it, if the BMI is dropping, it generally means people are losing weight. OK, because we don't shrink. It's more the other way, if that makes sense. So try to understand what's going on there, because it often happens when there's a period of extra stress. So I've seen it happen around going to high school, beginning of end of school terms, um, when there's some major change in the family, perhaps maybe somebody's died or someone's been ill. You know, or maybe there's something that's quite small for other people, but for that individual is quite big you know, and it's caused that extra stress. So usually there's something like that going on. And it may well be that the BMI is dropping because somebody is being a bit more restrictive, maybe exercising a bit more. So I think it's really important to understand why it's happening. Okay, because sometimes we can change those circumstances, we can improve things, and then hopefully it comes back up again. I think if you can't, it's just a question of, we just keep going to GP and kind of expressing your concern about it. Um, 
you know, and then hopefully that will be taken seriously. I mean, I, I have experience of different services having different thresholds for BMI, if that makes sense as to when they kind of say, yes, this is low enough now for us to see you. That There doesn't seem to be a uniformity about that. So that doesn't help, I think. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, reach out to the health professionals you're involved with, but most of all, try to find out what, why that's happening, if you can. Okay. And um, the last question I'm going to ask um, is from Tegan, and it is a little bit specific, so you may not be able to answer it, but I'm yeah. going to ask it because she's asked lots of times. Yeah. Um, her child is two and not diagnosed with anything yet. Um, yeah. Yeah. He only eats crisps and milky buttons, um, okay. and she's she's still breastfeeding him, and she would uh, she would like to stop, but she's yeah. scared that um, it won't be good for him if it's if oh. she stops. Yeah. Okay. So two is an interesting age, Tegan. Okay, so lots of children at the age of two are still kind of not fully weaned or have had some of those kind of, you know, early difficulties. It, it, and like you say, it's not diagnosed with anything. And actually at the age of two, it's quite hard to diagnose something like ARFID uh, in the same way it's quite hard to diagnose something like autism because we're still sort of waiting for things to emerge and have a better picture of things, if that makes sense. Um, I'm gonna presume you've had some health visitor involvement or some GP involvement. They may have said, don't worry about it, it'll all happen in good time. Um, I think your, your key is how, to, is how to wean from the breast milk and have a, something that can sustain your child um, without that really. And I think you're gonna need a bit of extra professional help for that by the sound of things. I would check out that infant and toddler forum website that I talked about before. Um, they've got some fantastic information on there around early feeding problems and there's one on there about sort of very extreme refusal and you know and there's also some other stuff on there about weaning so have a look at that and see if that's helpful but I would contact your health visitor and and all your GP and hopefully they can support you with bridging him onto some new foods and hopefully that problem will disappear for you although if it persists and I say if it persists beyond the age of three or four then start to ask people to probably look at that okay that well helps. thank you ever so much liz uh, it's been a brilliant session i'm sorry everybody if we didn't get to ask answer your question yeah uh, we are going to collect them that we're going to collect mm. them as much as we Good. can <laughs> so there's a lot yeah. in the chat um but yeah. Uh, one of my uh, Vicky, my um, one of our trustees has already collated quite a lot of them, and I will try oh, to get the ones that she uh, missed when she had to go. Yeah. So uh, thanks everyone for joining yeah. us, and thanks yeah. to Liz. I'm sure you'll agree that it's been really, really useful and helpful. And I yeah. hope um, I hope that it has kind of put your minds at rest if you were blaming yourself in any way um, for your child having difficult eating issues um, and I hope that it has helped you to kind of help yourself if you like and help your own family because mm. let's face it the, most of what we have to do is helping ourselves isn't it um, oh, so anyway yeah. thank you ever so yeah. much um, and that's okay have a good night um, yeah goodbye everybody thanks for, bye. thanks for all the interesting questions bye bye